everybody. I wanted to share this clip with you. It's from a class I recently taught uh, entitled The Bible for Busy People. It's all about the basics of biblical interpretation. So I hope you enjoy. And if you are interested in joining any of our future classes, you can check us out at www.jessup.edu slash cbs or you can follow the link in the description best way to get involved with us is to become a member of the center for bible study any recurring monthly donation for as little as or less than a cup of coffee a month you can become a member of the center for bible study that gives you access to all of our past classes and entrance into all of our classes in the future uh, keeps you up to date with everything we're doing helps support um, the ongoing work we're doing, including on this YouTube channel. So thanks for your consideration and enjoy the clip from class. So let's do a little bit of practice with historical context. I got two passages that we're going to look at. And uh, just with the person next to you, I'm going to throw up the passage. I'll read it real quickly. I've given you some underlines here already to kind of highlight for you some things that I want, want to put in your mind, right? But um, let me read it. And then what I want you to consider is kind of as you're looking at this passage, making sense of it. So I give you the reference. It's Mark 3, 1 through 6. Um, I want you to think about some of these questions that we talked about in the previous slide. In particular, what are things in this passage? Yeah, and if you have a print Bible with you, go ahead and turn to that as well. That's that's wonderful. Um, what, are, what are things in this passage that you think, hmm, I think I need to know, know about this or know more about this to really get what's going on in this text? So this is Mark 3, 1 through 6, still early on in Jesus' ministry. It's actually the fifth uh, passage in a row of a series of controversies that Jesus is having with certain religious teachers. It says, again, he entered the synagogue, and there was a man there who had a withered hand. They watched him to see whether he would cure him on the Sabbath, so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, come forward. Then he said to them, is it lawful to do good or to do harm on the Sabbath, to save a life or to kill? But they were silent. He looked around at them with anger. He was grieved at their hardness of heart and said to the man, stretch out your hand. He stretched it out and his hand was restored. The Pharisees went out and immediately conspired with the Herodians against him, how to destroy him. So, it's a nice passage because it's short and sweet, uh, but a lot of cultural references going on here. So just with the person next to you, maybe see if you can pick out a couple things that you think would be really important uh, to highlight in this passage, either things that stick out to you and you're like, aha, I know what's going on here, or something that you say, mm, I think I'd like to do a little more digging here to get a sense of what's going on. So just take a couple minutes with the person next to you. What are things that stick out to you as being important? Okay. Um, okay, yeah, let's stop there. We're going to do more kind of in-depth stuff. This is just to kind of get us started. Uh, so I had some someone online pointed out uh, Sabbath, synagogue, anything else that you, you see here that's like sticks out to you uh, that you think, yeah, this is an important kind of cultural reference to, when it comes to making meaning of what's going on here. Well, I think, I think you have to know how many laws there were. There's just like 50 or 60. They're, they're big on laws. Okay, very good, Chris. So Clearly, there's something going on here with Sabbath, right? We can see in this text, it's an issue of the time on which this is occurring. That's reference. So Sabbath, and we can see from the debate that Jesus is having, he recognizes that there is a legal issue at stake, meaning interpretation of the Torah, the law. Okay? And so that's really important. So right away, that should kind of activate in us. That seems to be the, the crux of the matter. Okay, what, what can you do on the Sabbath? What's lawful? What isn't lawful? And the debate around that. Uh, what does the Torah, does anybody know what the Torah says about the Sabbath in terms of what you can or can't do? Yeah, because that implies work and that's against the law. Well, that's good. But, you know, that comes from, uh, from inter that comes from like later rabbinic uh, law or interpretation. So what's fascinating is the Torah itself, which is the most authoritative part of the Bible for Jewish interpretation, the first five books of the Bible, does it, it says don't work on the Sabbath. It doesn't explain what work is. So naturally, if you want to honor the commandment, you are going to need to interpret it and understand what, what does work mean or doesn't, doesn't mean. Which, by the way, in the opening of Acts, chapter 1, 
Luke mentions that they, the disciples, after Jesus had been uh, had just ascended, they were praying on the Mount of all of it, and they walked a Sabbath day's journey back to the upper room. Uh, what is Luke telling us? They only traveled the distance that was permissible within oral interpretation of the law uh, at the time, a Sabbath day's journey. So that's precisely the issue, right? Is Sabbath, uh, synagogue, do we know synagogue, what, what that is, more or less? It's like a, a house of, uh, it's a place where Jews would come together to interpret scripture, primarily to interpret scripture and pray. And we have synagogues in Jerusalem, but throughout the ancient world, these were places where Jews would gather on the Sabbath to hear interpretation of scripture, basically, right? So Jesus is there on the, on, on the holy day, the Sabbath, the day you don't work, at the synagogue, and he's kind of set up here, right? There's some kind of setup. They, they're waiting to see if he's going to, uh, if he's going to heal. But the Jews yes. did a pretty good job with this story because they talked to, the Pharisees were talking about, this was not a life or death situation. Uh, this guy was still going to have a weird hand tomorrow. Uh -huh. Why did Jesus choose to heal him, heal him on the Sabbath in the synagogue? You know? Yeah, yeah, and that's a really good kind of nuanced point that within Jewish interpretation, there actually isn't a debate. Pretty much all agree that if a life is at stake, life is prioritized over the other commandments, right? Um, which is really interesting. That's a really important point. Like um, we think of all of these laws as being exactly the same. Like every law is the same. You're just rule followers. But they recognize that laws had priorities and some were central and some were peripheral. Well, the commandment to preserve life supersedes any of the other commandments. So the rabbis will say, like, you've got to circumcise a child on the eighth day. Otherwise, they're out. That's what Genesis 17 says. But if the child's life is in danger, you don't circumcise them on the eighth day. You wait, even though technically by the law that would put them out. So it, 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 what it shows us is that Jew, Jewish interpretation, we sometimes think of like Jewish, Jewish legalism as being kind of bound to all these different commandments. But they weren't arbitrary commandments, and they had ways of interpreting it. So the, the logic that Jesus employs here is actually a very Jewish logic. Uh, but you might have some that would dispute whether it was necessary, a life was actually in danger in that yeah. moment. Could you have not ridden David? Could tomorrow? you have waited or something like <laughs> yeah. that? Uh, but Jesus is probably particularly prioritizing the restoration of this person on that day and kind of making it a life or death uh, issue. Or in the interpretation of life or death issue. Is there more to the withered hand, or? I think the withered hand is kind of a symbolic for a, a partial death or decay of a person. And so he sees this as, he sees Sabbath time as the time where he does his restor restorative work, because Sabbath is uh, pointing ahead to God's ultimate restoration. So I think that there's, there's a bit of that uh, going on here. Um, and I think he just prioritizes the, the wellness of the person over, over that, you know, waiting or something like that in this case. Um, what was also interesting though is we get this these two groups introduced here at the bottom, Pharisees and Herodians. Right? So a lot of us have probably heard of the Pharisees before. They're the most common Jewish school group mentioned in the New Testament. Uh, these were experts and teachers of the law. Um, from all we can tell, despite you know some of the New Testament you know, polemic against some of the Pharisees. It's also good to remember Paul was a Pharisee. So one of the most famous Christians we know of was a Pharisee. And Acts also tells us that some Pharisees followed Jesus. So um, it, it isn't the case that Pharisees bad necessarily. But Jesus does get into debates with them because they are the uh, leading authorities of the day. And they agree on a lot. So the places that they disagree are going to become really potential big points of contention. In particular, the Pharisees with whom Jesus disagrees don't recognize his claim to authority, and that's a huge, you know, huge issue. The Herodians, anybody heard of that group before? Who are the Herodians? Political. Yeah, a political group, Herod, right? We know Herod the Great. Uh, we just celebrated Christmas season, um, or still celebrating Christmas season, depending on your tradition. But, um, you know, Herod was the Jewish king who has all the uh, young Jewish boys killed um, because he's worried about another king. And 
his sons then kind of take over parts of his territory. So in the Gospels, the Herod that's mentioned is one of his sons, Herod Antipas. So this is a political group that are loyalists to Herod and Herod's sons, basically, right? They're loyal to the current ruling regime. So we have a conspiracy here between the group that's concerned about Jesus breaking the Sabbath, right? Uh, and they're conspiring over what? What do they want to do? Well, isn't that, isn't that ironic? So it's about life and death. One, one person, Jesus, is about restoring life. The other group is plotting death. And um, if in rabbinic law, it specifically talks about plotting uh, harm to another person on the Sabbath is absolutely work. <laughs> it's a violation of the Sabbath. So ironic, what, what Mark is really showing us here, ironically, is that Jesus isn't the Sabbath breaker, because if you follow his interpretation, he's doing the will of God on the Sabbath, restoring life. The group that is trying to trap him is breaking the Sabbath by conspiring to kill him. So it's a highly ironic uh, passage um, if we follow along with the logic of, of what's going on. But we're exactly right to think that the heart of this passage has to do with what you can and can't do on the Sabbath. And that's the debate. That's the cultural debate uh, that's taking place.